They put they put him in the pillory. It didn't work out well for him. They didn't like him. Well, here's the thing. Here's what happened. As soon as they figured out he was a Baptist, it didn't care what kind of tie he wore, or what kind of suit he had, or what kind of hair he had. They hated him. They stuck him in the pillory. Remember that? Isn't that what it was called? The pillory? Is that what it's called? Let me see. Yeah. I call them the Wiggers. <laughs> they they were. I I read the travels of true godliness. Didn't I read that to you guys? The Wiggers? Could have been. Could have been. It's just jealousy, I think, though, that you don't like it. Look. Look out. Yeah, I wouldn't wear one. No, I wouldn't wear one. I, I don't know how. I don't I don't know how that came about. But if that was popular, uh, no, I wouldn't have. If that was popular, I'd have been unpopular. I'd have been like, nah, that's gay. We're not into that. But now, in all fairness, too, th with those guys that had those wigs on, the women all had hair, like, down to their knees. So, like, no woman had short hair. Like, that Like that didn't happen. No, they had their own, they had their own long, flowing hair. I still wouldn't have wore. I, I still wouldn't have wore the wig though. That was for prominent people, and I'm not prominent, so I would never have had one. I was. I was on the other side of the Baptist tracks. You think I should wear a wig? Which hat? I have. Oh, my tricorn hat. I want to get a real nice one of those when I'm out out east next time out, or out in Virginia or wherever that I, I want it I do want one of those look let's be honest I want a lot of different hats I do I like different hats right what what's that look like ah uh, look look <laughs> All right, here, here's how it works. You get it for me, and I'll wear it. You get it for me, and I'll wear it. I'm fine. I'll wear it once. Yeah. That's not really a hat. Oh, really? Those are so ugly. My brother had one of those mullets. Man, were they ugly. Remember the rat tails? Remember the, the, remember the rat? That was so stupid. What were immodest knickers? Man, I wonder if somebody in, I wonder if somebody I want I want to preach a sermon on immodest knickers. <laughs> that could be what I call them. Okay, all the kids are sugared up, it's time to go. All right. Now we are gonna talk about you know, I, I don't know what I'm gonna call this yet. We can call it why I preach against alcohol. We could call it that. I'm not against that uh, against uh, that title, but I really want our children to understand biblically, uh, you know, about drunkenness, about drunkards, really, about what the Bible says about that. And God still hates it. You know, God's still uh, against it. And the Bible, our Bible still against it. Um, and I think preachers ought to still preach against it. You know, I don't think you would need half of these groups that they have out there, those those faith-based addiction programs and all those other things that they call them. I don't think you would need half of those out there if God's men just preached it. Now they want to, you know, do some kind of psychological thing to get them in the door and get them into these groups and get them into these 10-step programs. And, you know, they, they kind of, so, so there's almost like some acceptance to it in some ways, uh, that there's like a, a softer way to approach the subject. Well, having had two family members killed by alcohol, I don't really think there's a soft way to talk about that. 
I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think there's like an easy way to really, uh, or a, a way to, 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 you know, psychologically deal with that besides just tell the truth about it and just be very blunt about it. Just like any other sin, just like anything else, we need to be blunt about it. And, you know, so we're going to pray and then we're going to get into it. We're going to go through a bunch of verses. We're just going to go through a lot of verses today is what we're going to do. Uh, and, and it'll be good. And, you know, I, I want you to remember, you young people to remember this. I want you to remember what the Bible says about this. I want you to understand what God expects from you concerning this subject. And, you know, us as adults, like, we ought not be ashamed of our position, you know. Uh, we ought not be ashamed as, as, you know, there's a lot of people like James White and other, other charlatans out there um, like him that, that, are, that are preaching basically, I mean, tattoos and booze. They have the, their groups, right? Isn't, isn't there one like tattoos and booze? I don't know. Is it something like that? Yeah. So tattoos and booze. So basically, James White, a church he was connected with, they, they, yeah, he, they tat, they, they had people come in to start a church in Hawaii. They gave out tattoos and beer. What are tattoos? Well, that's, that's, well, that's an excellent question. A tattoo is a marking that someone puts in their flesh, and they put it somewhere or wherever in their body of different pictures or different things, uh, like what Aaron has on his arm. That's Show him that, Aaron. That could be. Aaron, show him that thing on your arm. See that on Aaron's arm? That's a tattoo, and Aaron doesn't like that, but it's there. That's hot sauce. But you see that black thing on his arm? That's a tattoo. It's printing in the flesh. And God doesn't like that. And the Bible speaks of that in Leviticus about carving into your flesh and, and things of that nature. I, I think it's wonderful that you asked me that question, that you had no idea uh, what that is. That's, a, that's a really a great thing, actually. Exactly. That's right. And there's a lot. I'll teach on it again sometime. We taught on it years ago, in a, but I'll, I'll do it my way instead of creepy, weird people in the video like I did. But anyway, um, I'll <laughs> Anyway, <coughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, long gone. Yeah, what one? I don't remember. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> anyway, so, but we're going to talk about, but, but unfortunately, that's what churches have come to today. And then they defend it. But if you use a faulty Bible version like they do, and you defend faulty Catholic Bible versions, you shouldn't be surprised if James White's okay with you drinking booze and tattooing your body up, right? What's that mean? James White does? Well, I mean, if you look at him, he's, he, like, he's trying to make sure that like, makes him look tough. It doesn't help. Sorry, James. It doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. You just look like any other lost guy walking down the street, okay? Anyway, so, um, but, so it's important for churches to really have a position on these things, take a stand on them, talk about them. You know, they, they've become really huge parts of pop culture now. And churches have become really big uh, proponents of pop culture. So let's get, let's get right into the Bible here. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for all that you do for us. Help us now as we go through the scriptures. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Genesis chapter 9, turn there. The first time we see drunkenness. Didn't take long, right? Noah. Isn't it sad that here's a man that's a righteous man, right? He fell to the sin of drunkenness. Genesis chapter 9, verse number 21, actually 20. And Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. 
And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and, t and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it upon both of their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. This is the first reference we see to drunkenness in the Bible. What also do you see that goes along with that? Nakedness. So, so immodesty, right? So that's the first sin that, that is accompanied with drunkenness as far as, that, as, as far as that goes. And it has forever been, those two have been tied together that you could see in society. And we, you'll see that as we go through the scriptures, that those that drink booze and those that drink alcohol, the first thing they do, they, they do a lot of fornication, a lot of drunkenness, a lot of adultery. By the way, there's a lot of stupid things that people do when they drink booze. And this was one stupid thing that happened. This is one stupid thing that occurred here that didn't have to. But it shows you the immodesty, the immoral actions, and everything else. Do you know the best way to never have that happen? Never drink it. Guess, guess what? I never have to guess how many of, uh, 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 of, a, of a drink is going to make me to where I lose my thought process and I lose my mind and I lose my, my uh, inhibition, so to speak, and all those other things. I, if I don't touch it, I'm never in danger of that. Do you understand that? If I don't touch it, you know, there's a lot of people that think, and we'll talk about that, that they could pick up an adder, they could pick up a snake, and they could play with it. A lot of people have been bitten by snakes. They think they can control it. Well, I, I can control it. No, you can't. It, it's, provo it, it's scientifically provable that once you have one drink, you're already, you've already got yourself to the fact that you don't know what you're, you don't know what you're capable of after that. Your inhibitions have already been loosened already. Impaired, that's right. Already. With one. That's just that's the way it works. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 19. We're not going to expound on all of these today as far as that goes because it would take too long. But I want to show you the, the great number of scriptures that are there for that. Genesis chapter 19, verse 30 through 36. And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain and his two daughters with him. And he feared to dwell in Zoar and he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. And the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night. And the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. And it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay yesterday night with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also, and go thou in, and lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father." As they, and they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay with him, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. Right? So, as you see this, what do you see? You see the same thing. There's no way if Lot was in his right mind at all that that would have ever happened. But he wasn't in his right mind. Because alcohol takes you out of your right mind. It impairs your judgment. It puts you into a place to where you don't have good judgment and you make very foolish mistakes. Many girls have lost their purity due to the fact that they thought one drink wouldn't hurt them. And many young men have as well. Right. Right. He had no he had he was so drunk that he had no knowledge of what was going on at all. By the way, that happens to people and they wake up and they don't know where they're at. Right? Happens all the time. We see people, and we go out and preach in front of these events. We know full well that some of them are going to be so drunk, they're not going to know where they wake up the next day. And they might not wake up. Like that one uh, young, uh, young lady that we preached to down here in Northfield, and she froze to death outside. She was drunk. She went out on New Year's Eve. She got into an argument. She walked out of the house on New Year's Eve. She was drunk, and she died in the snow, frozen to death. Real story. Right? Real story. Leviticus chapter 10, verse number 8. Let's look what the Bible says there. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine, nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations, that, and that ye may put difference between holy and unholy. So what's unholy? 
drinking the booze. What's, what, what's holy as in sanctified? Not. Abstaining from it. See the difference? Holy and unholy. Right. That's right, it does. Holy or unholy. What God calls holy is holy. What God calls unholy is not. It's wicked. It's sin. And between unclean and clean. And that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord had spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. You know how many Catholic drunk priests are out there that nobody listens to half of what they say? And even if they do say something or whatever the case may be. And, and now today you have in the world, you have Protestants, you have Baptists, you have all these people that are, that are, that are pushing, drinking booze, and it's okay to socially drink. I mean, they're, they're, they're making breweries. Think about that. Numbers chapter 6, verse number 3. He shall separate himself from wine and strong drink and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar or strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation, he shall eat nothing that is made of the vine tree from the kernels even to the husk. You know, the Nazarite wasn't allowed to even touch the grape. Why? Because he, it was a picture. So for him, at his vow, he wasn't even allowed to touch a grape. He wasn't allowed to have anything to do with it. Just stay away from it. Right? Oh, that's right. He wasn't allowed to have any of it. Just leave it alone. Just stay away from it. Because the, of the picture. Because of the picture that, you know, I happen to believe that, and this, this sounds funny, but I, I happen to believe that that grape grew as on a vine on the ground, along the ground or whatever. I think it was a tree once. And I think that grape has been the curse. It has been the curse ever since the fall of man. And it didn't take very long. And I don't think it was an apple. I think it was that. I think it was the wine. That's what I think. And I think it became a curse to man. And I think it, I think it still is today from that standpoint. You can see it. Numbers cha or Deuteronomy chapter 21 and verse number 20. And they shall say unto the elders of this city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. So he just sat around, wouldn't work, wouldn't do anything, just ate all the time and was a drunkard. Right? So they had to deal, they had to deal, they had to, to pronounce judgment against their children if they couldn't get them to mind or to do do what do what they were supposed to do. Um, every time I get close to that, it does that, doesn't it? Sorry, Dave, I'm not gonna be able to walk over by you. I'm just gonna have to stay over here. All right. But uh, every time. That they that they that they would go out and drink these booze, or a, or a young man was found drinking this booze, stubborn, rebellious, wouldn't obey. They were punished. Now we don't live under Old Testament law. We understand that. We thank God for that, that we've been saved by grace. But how much the more should we be obedient and stay and depart from these things? Deuteronomy twenty nine verse six: You have not eaten bread, neither have you drunk wine or strong drink, that you might know that I am the Lord your God. You know, the, the judgment of those that, that follow drunkenness, it's, it's impaired so, so, um, so much that they can't even function. You know, there are Christians out there that believe it's okay to do that. And the problem is, is their walk with God is so, you know, there's a man right now, and I'm watching him online. I've watched him. He's, he's a street preacher, but all he does is talk about politics now. Like his whole page is full of politics. Everything he says is about, is about liberty and politics and everything else. This street preacher, instead of preaching anymore outside of these places, he's actually being security for these bars, and he goes in and he drinks booze at these bars. This is a preacher, supposedly, right? Right here in Minnesota. And now this preacher thinks it's okay he thought it was okay before, but now I'm watching. I'm like, what, what kind of testimony is that? What would make anyone want to turn from drunkenness and sin and, and drug abuse and fornication, all those things, when the preacher's doing it? That's what happened with Eli in his house, right? Judges chapter 13, verse number 7. The Nazarite vow again. 
But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and now drink no wine nor strong drink. Neither eat any unclean thing, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Thou shalt conceive and bear a son, right? Drink no wine nor strong drink. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1. I found this interesting, that in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse number 13, Hannah didn't like the fact that she was likened to somebody that drank booze. She said that was a son of Belial, or a daughter of Belial. Look what she says here in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse number 13. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. You know, here's a woman that was sad, but you know, it's interesting because those that drink booze, they get more sorrowful. You'd think they'd get you think they'd get better, but they don't actually. If you drink a lot of liquor and you're and you're a drunk and you get drunk like that, what happens is you don't you get you get more sorrowful. You don't get Yeah. It's bad. It's terrible. They're not happy people. Most of them they want to die. That booze doesn't help that at all. It makes it worse. And Hannah answered, not so, my Lord. And at, uh, let's see, and Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. So you know what? She was accused of that. And when David had called, oops, wrong verse, sorry. Um, anyway, so in that text right there, what we find is we find Abigail, or we find um, Hannah there. And what we find about her that is so pressing is the fact that she says, I'm not that daughter of Belial. I'm not one of those people. I'm not, I'm not one of those people. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be caught drinking that. I wouldn't be caught being an alcoholic or a drunk. Isn't that something? How, how she could identify. Count not thy servant, she said. I'm going to go to there because I didn't write that down. Is it verse 16? Okay. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. So what she's saying is, is that I'm not one of those women. Well, you couldn't tell the difference between those two today in, in the world today and in modern churches that you wouldn't even be able to tell the difference between a daughter of Belial and that. You know, it's a shame when Christians are drinking booze today and they're partying it up and they're living it like that and pastors and churches are supporting these things. Where are kids going to ever go to understand the truth when, they're, when, when the people that are supposed to be responsible for their life, when they're, when they're, when they're not living for God, when they're not staying separate from the world, when they're doing the dope and the drugs and the alcohol and the running around and everything else that the world is doing, what do you, how do you expect these kids are going to grow up and how they're going to be raised and how they're going to live in society today? There's so many confused people. I want it to be where people aren't confused when it comes to where our stand is and what we believe, that they're not, there's no confusion there, that they know exactly where we stand very clearly. 1 Samuel 25, verse number 36, And Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he held a feast in his house, like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry with him, for he was very drunken. Wherefore she told him nothing, less or more, until the morning light. What ended up happening to him? His heart hardened, and he died like a week later. That's what happened to him. There isn't anything good that comes from drinking liquor. There's no good that comes from that. There's no good that comes from people drinking beer and alcohol. There's no, there's no good that comes from it. God knows it. God, God instituted in his word. He showed us very plainly. 2 Samuel eleven thirteen. 13. David. David used booze. He used alcohol to destroy Uriah's life. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him, and he made him drunk. And at even he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but went not down to his house. David used alcohol to get Uriah drunk. The Bible pronounces a woe upon that. And I'll show you that. Boy, I don't know why God's people would ever want to play with something that has a woe pronounced on it. 
Why would you want to get near it? First Kings chapter 16, verse number 9. And his servant Zimri, captain of half of his chariots, conspired against him as he was in Terza, drinking himself drunk in the house of Arza, steward of his house in Terza. Drinking himself drunk. Pretty common when you start drinking alcohol. First Kings 20, verse number 16. And they went out at noon. But Benadad was drinking himself drunk in the pavilions, he and the kings, and 30 and two kings that helped him. Drinking themselves drunk, because that's what happens when you drink, right? They drink themselves drunk. Job chapter 12, verse number 25. They grope in the dark without light and maketh them to stagger like a drunken man. So it's describing the, the effects of alcohol on a man that's when he's drunk and what it does to him. They stagger. They stagger around and stumble. You ever watched them? Well, you know it. Some of you have been there when you, when you weren't living for God or when you were wrong with God or when you were a lost person. You remember that. Staggering around. Right? Foolishly. Psalm 69, 12. They that sit in the gate speak against me, and I was the song of drunkards. Drunkards sing the fool's songs. You ever watch them? What's the first thing they do when they go to those bars? They get people drunk, they'll put them in front of karaoke machines. Right? Song of drunkards, which is basically a song of woe in a lot of ways. Very much so. Psalm 107, verse 27, they reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. The Bible's describing those that go through heavy affliction sometimes, that they'll reel to and fro and stagger in their minds and their hearts like a drunken man, right? Here it shows you again the effects of alcohol in the system. To reel to and fro, no control. No control over your mind. No control over your body. Turn to Proverbs 23 because we'll be there a while. Verse number 21. First. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. Drunkenness and poverty pretty much go hand in hand. Skip down to verse number 26. My son, give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. For a whore is a deep ditch. And a strange woman is a narrow pit. Isn't that something how God puts drunkenness with whore, with whoring around right there together? She also lieth in wait as for prey and increaseth the transgressors among men. Then he goes on to explain the drunkard's life. Who hath woe? Let's do something here. So what is that? I'll show you. We'll get you the definition of that. That word. Great sorrow or distress. Things that cause sorrow or trouble. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow or distress or troubles? The drunk. The drunk. By the way, I don't like that term alcoholic. Just use what the Bible says. Call him a drunk, drunkard. That's what the Bible says. Calls the sin of drunkenness, and they're drunks. That's what they are. Try to soft sell it, make it make it sound nicer. There's no way to no, know. Just a sloppy drunk. 
Right. Yeah, yeah, that's how they changed it. That's right. That's right. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Sorrow upon sorrow. Right? Who hath contentions? You ever seen people drunk? How I mean, constant fighting and contentions. Contentions? Contentions? Constantly? Constantly fighting. Contentious. They can't. Man, I... When I was a lost man, I was around a lot of women that if they got drunk, they were just, they were the meanest, biggest mouth, nasty people ever. And so were guys, but they were just mean and nasty with their mouth. They got mean, they got mad, they got, they got angry and vicious with the way they spoke and the way they talked to people. They were very contentious. Or men, you want to see, you know, two men fight. You, you know why they have bouncers at bars? Hey, guess why they don't have a bouncer over at McDonald's? Right? Because, right, unless you don't wear your mask. <laughs> he said, right, no drunk on Big Macs. That's right. But you know something? They, you know, right? You go, I mean, they don't have a bouncer there. There's no bouncer at the gas station. There's no bouncer... But where's there a bouncer at? At the club where there's, and at the bar, there's a bouncer there. Why? Because there's men fighting all the time. Because when you add alcohol, you add fights. Listen to me. Don't ever be dumb enough to marry a man. Girls, listen to me very closely. Don't ever be dumb enough to marry a man that tells you he's a social drinker. Oh, I'm just a social drinker. I believe it's, I don't believe it's wrong or I don't believe it's a sin. Don't marry that man. Don't, don't marry him. Don't, don't marry him. Right? Everything in moderation, the Lutheran doctrine, the Minnesota Lutheran doctrine, everything in moderation. That's a Minnesota Lutheran doctrine, if you didn't know that. It's really popular. Right? That's right. Exactly. Listen very closely. Don't ever marry a woman or a man. You, you, the, you, you young men, don't ever marry a woman that, says that, that thinks it's okay to drink. Drink booze. Don't do it. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? You want to fight all the time? You want to have arguments all the time? Just get married and hooked up into a drunk. Because that's what happens. Who hath babbling? You ever listen to them babble on when they're drinking booze? People that are drunk, they babble on. They say nothing. They just babble. That's what they do. Bible's describing it right here. Who hath wounds without cause? What in the world happened? How did I get that? You wake up the next day and you don't know how you got it. I remember meeting a guy on the street about, I don't know, it was probably six months ago. We were out there at some event. And that guy was beat up everywhere. And they said, I mean, he was just mangled up in his face. Do you remember that guy? Remember that guy? And he was, he was beat up everywhere. And I said, what happened? He goes, oh, I got jumped. Yeah. Oh, by the gang of trannies? Yeah, they, they all jumped him. Why? Because he was drunk. And they were probably drunk. Or they saw he was drunk. And they robbed him, he said. He was drunk when he was talking to us. That's right. He had contentions. He had woes. He had wounds without cause. Who hath redness of eyes? That's what happens to drinking the drinking liquor. That's what happens. Eyes get all bloodshot. Right? Who are they? They that tarry long at the wine. They that go to seek mixed wine. They tarry at the booze. They're drinking booze. They're drinking liquor. Oh, beer's not that big of a deal, they'll tell you, or this is not that big of a deal, or that's not that big of a deal, or one drink's not that big of a deal. That's how Satan works. A little bit of poison won't kill you. Right. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red. So I'm not even I'm not even supposed to like set it in front of me and look at it. Well, I guarantee you one thing. If you don't look at it, you won't drink it. Right? It's pretty safe to say, isn't it, that if you don't look at it, you won't drink it.
when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright, and at last it biteth like a serpent. Why that analogy, right? He biteth like a, it biteth like a serpent. The snake's bite stingeth like an adder. You know what else happens? You don't control yourself. You're a fool. When you're drinking, you know how many men have raped women and how many women have been taken advantage of and probably women took advantage of men because of alcohol, because of drinking liquor. He said, but I don't know if I believe that. Well, believe what God said. He says, thine eyes shall behold strange women. And that's just not weird women. That's, but that's women that are not yours. Women that you are not. You know the difference in, in strange and familiar? My wife is familiar to me, right? All other women are strange to me. Amen. Right? Do you, do you understand that? You understand what I'm saying there? My wife, she, she's familiar to me. I'm familiar to her. But but all other women, they're, they're strange. They're, right? They should be. Amen? Thine eyes shall behold strange women. So you'll start looking at those women to lust after them. By the way, ladies, that young ladies, that's what men, that's what men do when they're, especially when they're on booze. Like, they, they don't care about anything else but themselves. That's how it works. No matter what they say with their mouth. And usually it's not good when they're drinking. It says, thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. See, that's what happens when people get drunk. They utter perverse and wicked things. You know what perverse means? It means perverted. It means against God. It means that which is corrupt and not right. Wicked. That's why you have all the fornication, all the things connected with liquor. The Bible shows us because God is warning us to stay away from it because of what it leads to. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me and I felt it not. Right? What happens? People get drunk. They get in fights. They get beat up. They don't feel it. Till the next day. And they feel it. When shall I awake? What does that mean? That's the hangover. That's the time where they try to sleep it off. I will seek it yet again. See, they go through this vicious cycle, right? They go through this vicious cycle, and then they seek it again. They seek what is destroying them again. They seek it yet again. That's, that's what happens when you drink alcohol. That's what happens when you, when, you, when you become a booze hound like that, and you follow that. Proverbs 26.9. As a thorn goeth up into the hand of a drunkard, so is a parable in the mouth of fools. Ecclesiastes 10, 17. Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. That's dealing with, you know, surfeiting or eating too much. Isaiah 5, 11, woe unto them that rise up early in the morning that they may follow strong drink and continue until night till wine and flame them. Think about that for a second because you see that I, I know a lot. My grandpa was like that. My grandpa, I mean, he just, all he did was drink all the time. That's all he did. Like his whole life, that's all he did. He just drank, drank booze. Every time I seen him, he was always, uh, he was 80 something years old hanging out at the bar. Drinking at the, this little hole in the wall bar all the time, drunk himself till he went home and went to bed. You see these people; they have no life. That that's their life is is a bottle. That's all they have, and that's all they do is drink liquor constantly. 
They're never sober. Never at all. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. That's, you know, the judgment of somebody who's a drunkard is horrible. It's absolutely horrendous. In fact, your judgment is so impaired when you're on alcohol it's just like any other drug like that, but it's, there's something about it that's, that makes it so much more accessible and so much worse in that sense. Because alcohol, when it gets to you, it's something that's so deceptive that people think that they can just grab that snake and they can just take it in. They can take fire into their bosom and they're going to be just fine. But they're not. The Bible says, therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness and their blossom shall go up as dust because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Their judgment and punishment. Isaiah 19, 14, the Lord hath mingled a perverse spirit in the midst thereof, and they have caused Egypt to err in every work thereof as a drunken man staggereth in his vomit. That's another thing. Vomiting. Yeah, you vomit out poison, that's right. And when people drink liquor, what do they do? They vomit. They get sick. That's right. It makes them sick. Yep. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness. So that there is no place clean. That's what God says about it. Isaiah 56, 12. Come ye, say they, I will fetch wine, and we will fill ourselves with strong drink. And tomorrow shall be as this day, and much more abundant. See, the drunkard thinks, hey, everything's going to be fine. We'll just keep drinking. Everything's going to be great as long as I can get to the bar, as long as I can drink, as long as I can continue on. Isaiah 24, 20, the earth shall reel to and fro like the drunkard. The Bible, again, talks about that, wheeling, that reeling to and fro, what, what the effects of alcohol. Isaiah 28, verse 1, woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. The, you know, America is just full of drunkards. Absolutely. I mean, do you know what's thrived? You know, churches were shut down. Their buildings were anyway. Were shut down and liquor stores were providing drivers, uh, drive-by services. Right? Curbside service. So if you wanted to get, so they said the drunkards and everybody else, they were selling booze like crazy. Lakeville Liquor was so packed and these other Northfield Liquor and all these other, they were so packed with people that were on lockdown, all they were doing was sitting around drinking booze all the time. Record sales. So all under other industries, right? Other things were just beat up. Where restaurants were absolutely begging to be able to sell liquor curbside to make it because they knew there was such money in it. Because they couldn't be open to sell food. But you could order, but I think the governor passed some special legislation or whatever, signed his, well, actually, he didn't pass any legislation, let's be real. <laughs> let, me, let me backtrack. The governor made a decree that all of Minnesota should have liquor. So, right, they kept the liquor stores open, and people could just go get as much as they wanted. They even bend the laws by executive order. So you could have more liquor, so you could have better access to liquor, so you could pick up liquor from like your favorite restaurant when you were getting when you're outside curb, because technically you're not supposed to transport that. So they passed a yeah they passed special uh, decrees so people could pick up their booze with their food. 
Did you see that? They did that. Think about that. Isaiah 29, 9, stay yourselves in wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. So another reference to that. Isaiah 37, 25, I have digged and drunk water. And with the sole of my feet have I dried up all the rivers of the besieged places. I don't know where I got that verse at. Isaiah 49, 26, and I will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh. And they shall be drunken with their own blood. As with sweet wine and all flesh shall know that I am the Lord. That I the Lord am the Savior and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. What does the Bible say? The difference in old wine or the difference in liquor. Thus saith the Lord as the new wine is found in the cluster. And one saith, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it. So will I do for my servants' sake, that I may not destroy them all. New wine is found in the cluster. Mine, Jeremiah said this, Jeremiah 23, 9, Mine heart within me is broken because of the prophets. All my bones shake. I am like a drunken man. What happens with drunken men? They shake. Some of them, they get the shakes. If they can't get their liquor, if they can't have it, or they have too much, right? They get the shakes, right? And like a man whom wine hath overcome. Jeremiah 25, 27, Therefore thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Drink ye and be drunken, and spew, and fall, and rise no more, because of the sword which I will send among you. Jeremiah 48, 26, make ye him drunken, for he magnified himself against the Lord. You know, drunkenness is a, is a punishment. Moab also shall wallow in his vomit, and he shall be in derision. You know, men like, was it Jimi Hendrix? Didn't he die choked on his own vomit? Is that how he died, or somebody said that? Jimi Hendrix, I think it was. Yeah, they were drunk. Yeah, and they died on their, they choked on their own vomit and died. How'd you like to die choking on your own vomit? Right? Do they really, brother? So, because he'll choke to death on his, wow. One of my brother's friends at the same time that my niece's mother died. Uh, it wasn't too long after that. One of my brother's other friends, I knew him. I, I grew up with him. He lived across the street from us when I was a kid. Um, he was drinking. He went to bed, and he choked on his own vomit. Died. How glorious is that? You know, great, you can get drunk, and you can drink booze. and Great, you turn 21 years old, and you can drink yourself to death. That's wonderful. What a wonderful way to live your life. Young kid die like that. Yeah. Lamentations 4.21. Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, that dwellest in the land of Uz. The cup also shall pass through unto thee. Thou shalt be drunken and shalt make thyself naked. See what God shows you there? Those two things are forever together. How many girls have went out and at proms and all these other things, gotten drunk, lost their purity, had a baby? You know how many abortions have been committed because of that, because of alcohol? How many babies have been murdered because of that? Ezekiel 23, 33, thou shalt be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, with the cup of astonishment and desolation, with the cup of thy sister Samaria. Joel 1, 5, awake ye drunkards and weep and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. Nahum 1, 10, for while they be folded together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble, fully dry. Nahum 3.11, 
Thou also shalt be drunken, thou shalt be hid. Thou also shalt seek strength because of the enemy. Drunkards. I want you to turn to Habakkuk chapter 2. The Bible has a, a pronouncement here, a woe. Verse number 15. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink. Comma. Now there's a comma there. But that's a complete thought right there too, isn't it? Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink. How many people have given kids just a sip of booze, a sip of liquor, and got them started? How many parents left booze around their kids and they got it? Yeah, they will. Woe unto him. Pronounces a judgment, a sorrow. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him. And makest him drunk, drunken also. It's a judgment. You know, I, I as a lost man, I, I was guilty of this. Whatever it was, pot, drugs, liquor. Yeah. Right. And make us him drunken also that thou mayest look on their nakedness. That's another step further. By the way, every man knows or has a good understanding of what alcohol does. Its effects on women, its effects on the inhibitions of people. That's right. It's exactly true. And that's what lost men do. And that's what people that aren't right with God do, just like, you know, with Lot's daughters and things like that. That's a judgment. That's a pronounced judgment there. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Now let me stop here and say this, that... There are a lot of people out there that believe that Jesus turned water into alcoholic wine or fermented wine. Right? It's the most foolish thing I've ever heard that Jesus would enable people to drink booze to get them to a place to where they would be drunk. Right? When God pronounced a woe on it and Jesus obeyed the law of God perfectly. See how foolish it is? It's foolish. Very foolish. What I don't understand is because I, I was saved from that mess, so I can't understand why anybody wants to go back to that or thinks, well, I think I'll play with it casually. It's like, you know, I'll casually smoke a joint. Right. Casually, you know, hit some acid. I'll casually eat some shrooms. I'll casually drink a fifth of Jack. Whatever it is. I, to me, I'm like, I, I don't, like, I got saved out of that. I don't want to go back to that. Like, that life, I, I don't want anything to do with that life anymore. I hate it because I've seen the destruction of it. I've seen what it does, how it destroys people's lives. I remember the day that my dad got a phone call that something happened to his mother. I was, it was probably, I think it was, dad, was it like 1985 or, no, was it 85? 84? I remember, I remember being a kid and I remember them getting a phone call that, that something, actually, no, it was my, it was uh, Uncle George that came 
uh, Aunt Donna's uh, husband came and said, Chet, sit down. I'll never forget it. He, he got the message at his house somehow because they couldn't get a hold of dad at the time. And I remember, I remember them coming, and my, my Uncle George, who was in, in the war and everything else, and he came and he said, Chet, sit down. I'll never forget it. And he said, sit down. I got to tell you something. And he had to sit there and tell him that your mother was in a horrible accident, and she's dead. She was out on a country road going about 30 miles an hour with her sister that she hadn't seen for years. And they were out just enjoying each other's company. And some drunk driver came down the road at a blind intersection, came down the road, I don't know, going 50 miles an hour, plowed into the car. And was she ejected from the vehicle or was it your aunt that was? To get out. She was dead on the scene right away. 70 miles an hour on a backcountry road, drunk, lost control, wasn't paying attention. She was killed instantly. 30 years before that, or was it 20 years before that, Dad? Your brother. He was hit. Same way. He was on a motorcycle. Drunk, plowed into him. Head on. Crossed over the lane. Killed him instantly. See? Life is not a game. It's serious. I remember when I was a kid... And I was a lost man. I, was, I, I told the story to a few of those guys. When I was lost, I was a young man, teenager. I was drinking, underage drinking, which who cares? It's all bad anyway, either way. But underage drinking, which is even worse in, in that sense. But because of a devil, no, no, no self-control at all with anything. I remember driving down the road. I remember thinking I was sober enough to drive like five hours later. You know, after I waited five or six hours, got into a car, drove down the road, car spins out of control, flipped it, rolled it, it landed on its, landed on its, on its uh, top, almost went through a house, could have been killed. God spared me, thank God. I wasn't saved. I went to hell. Amen. What was that from? Booze. Liquor. Drinking. Happens quickly. So the Bible pronounces a woe on this. That means if you... If you drink it and you hand a bottle to somebody else, there's a woe on you. Micah 2.11, if a man walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie, saying, I will prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink, he shall even be the prophet of this people. God said it's a curse. What do we have now? We have preachers stand up doing that right now. Look at John the Baptist's life in Luke chapter 1, verse number 15. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. You know, look at him. Look at his life. Look at John's life. He was a man that walked with God. He was a holy man. And what did he say? He wouldn't touch wine nor strong drink. Why in the world wouldn't God's people want to be lined up with that? Why would they want to be lined up with something completely opposite or what the world's doing or what's what's popular today? Churches today look more like like clubs than they do. Yeah, they look like nightclubs. They don't look like churches. Luke 21, 34, and take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. 
lack of sobriety and all those issues, surfeiting, drunkenness, and cares of this life. Romans 13, verse 13, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. Let us walk honestly. Ri look at rioting and drunkenness connected together. Riot, rioting and drunkenness. That's what we've seen, right? You ever seen those guys that w were downtown, were preaching out those places, those drunks come out of those bars, they come out of the thing, what do they do? They start riot, they'll start a riot. Absolutely drunk. A lot of times I think some of the people that we face would probably, once they sobered up the next day, they'd, they, they'd be ashamed at what they said. Maybe they're surprised when they see themselves on YouTube, I don't know. If they even remember it, right? Look what 1 Corinthians says about the child of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard. Or an extortioner with such a one, no not to eat. Drunkards. You're not to sit at fellowship with them. They're not to be in your church until they repent. 1 Corinthians 6.10, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. So you're going to preach casual drunkards, Will? That God's people ought to push casual drunkards will enter into the kingdom of heaven? That was added in. There must be a different version, right? It says right there, drunkards, that's right, shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. I, I would say that I would want to be as far away from that as I possibly could. Wouldn't you? Say, what does it say in the Greek? I don't know, probably the same thing it does in English. A little bit of extortion, Right? A little bit of thievery, social extortion. <laughs> yeah. It's the only time. Galatians 5.21, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before as I have told you in times past, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, 18, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. It's a pretty simple command, isn't it? Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. Drinking the booze is the excess, by the way. Right? It's not that you had one too many. It's the fact that you're doing it, period. You understand that? For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. I want to read you two stories here. And um, this, These two, and then we'll be done here, but th these two, this is from Richard Newton's book. Richard Newton was, uh, Charles Spurgeon referred to Richard, Dr. Richard Newton as the prince of preachers to the young. He tells some stories, and he's, he's so basically what Richard Newton would do, would, he would be on Sunday afternoons after his, after his morning service and everything else, he would, he would Sunday afternoons, he would, everybody would come together, and they would, you know, and he would kind of preach to the kids. He would, the children, and he would try to exhort and encourage the children. He did it for 30 years that he just tried to be an encouragement to them, okay? And he tried to teach them the Bible, and he tried to, you know, expound and, and really take an interest in them, okay? So I'm going to read this to you here, and um, I'll probably put this here. Let me see. What's that? Yep. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah, the Protestants and the Catholics using real alcohol, right? Uh, fermented wine, right? And I, I don't know. Do they do children take that communion too? Do they drink that too, or what? Really? Right. Wow. Wow. Okay. My friends, you don't know any, don't any of you know what trouble is? Will you please, Miss Gray, said the kind voice of one who knew her story, tell the ladies what you call trouble? I will, if you desire it, for in the words of the prophet, I am one who hath, been, who hath seen affliction. She goes on to say this, my parents were very well off and my girlhood was surrounded by all the comforts of life. Every wish of my heart was gratified and I was cheerful and happy. At the age of 19, I married one whom I loved more than all the world besides. Our home was retired, but the sun never shone upon a lovelier spot or a happier household. Years rolled on peacefully. Five lovely children sat around our table, and a little curly head, still nest, uh, curly head boy nestled in my bosom. One night, about sundown, one of those fierce black storms came on which are so common to our southern climate. For many hours, the rain poured down incessantly. Morning dawned, but still the elements raged. The country around us was overflowed. The little stream near our dwelling became a foaming torrent. Before we were aware of it, our house was surrounded by water. I managed with my babe to reach a little elevated spot where the thick foliage of a few wide spreading trees afforded some protection. While my husband and son strove to save what they could of our, of our property. At last, a fearful surge swept away my husband, and he never rose again. Ladies, no one ever loved a husband more, but that was not trouble. Presently, my sons saw their danger, and the struggle for life became the only consideration. They were as brave, loving boys as ever blessed a mother's heart. And I watched their efforts to escape with such agony as only mothers can feel. They were so far off that I could not speak to them, but I could see them closing nearer and nearer and nearer to each other as their little island grew smaller and smaller. The swollen river raged fearfully around the huge trees. Dead branches, upturned trunks, wrecks of houses, drowning cattle, and masses of rubbish all went floating past us. My boys waved their hands to me and then pointed upwards. I knew it was their farewell signal. And you mothers can imagine my anguish. I saw them perish. All perish. Yet that was not trouble. I hugged my baby close to my heart. And when the water rose to my feet, I climbed into the low branches of the tree and so kept retiring before, before it till the hand of God stayed the waters that they should rise no further. I was saved. All my worldly possessions were swept away. All my earthly hopes blighted. Yet that was not trouble. My baby was all I had left on earth. I labored day and night to support him and myself and sought to train him in the right way. But as he grew older, evil companions won him away from me. He ceased to care for his mother's counsels. He would sneer at her kind entreaties and agonizing prayers. He became fond of drinking. He left my humble roof that he might be unrestrained in his evil ways. And at last, one night, when heated by wine, he took the life of a fellow creature. He ended his days upon the gallows. God had filled my cup of sorrow before. Now it ran over. That was trouble, my friends, such as I hope the Lord in mercy may spare you from ever knowing. Richard Newton goes on to say this, boys. Girls, can you bear to think that you might bring such sorrow on your dear father and mother? If you would not, be on your guard against the giant intemperance. Let wine and liquors alone. Never touch them. That was a mother's sorrow. Here's another one that's even worse than that one. Let us look at the sorrow brought on a family by the same dreadful evil. 
Now, in temperance, what that was, he saw about his drinking and booze. That's what they, there was a temperance movement that swept across that they, you know, they had people sign temperance pledges that they wouldn't drink liquor and everything else. And the temperance movement was was very big. Now, the only movement I believe in is the local New Testament church. That's the movement of God. OK, uh, and I, I probably wouldn't be a part of their movements, although I agree with that, just like I agree with. Uh, abolishing abortion, except I don't want to be with about I don't want to be with any movement called abolish abortion. We we preached abolish abortion before it was cool. We didn't need any we didn't we didn't need any little little signs for it. We didn't need any of those things. We didn't need any monikers and we didn't need the world's money to do it. We just preached it like we always have. Amen. And God's people that have preached against liquor and booze and everything else, they don't need any of those other movements either. We don't need any of their groups. We are the institution that God has called to do that work. Amen. And we are the one that God is blessed to do it and promised perpetuity to. So remember that. All right. Let me tell you. Let us look at the sorrow brought on a family by the same dreadful evil. Let me tell you an old man's story. <clears throat> Many years ago, a temperance meeting was held in a certain village. A little boy who lived in the village was very anxious to go and persuade his father to take him. The boy never forgot that meeting, and he wrote the account of it years afterward. One of the speakers at the meeting was an old man. His hair was white, and his brow furrowed with age and sorrow. When he arose to spoke, he said, My friends, I am an old man standing alone at the end of life's journey. Tears are in my eyes and deep sorrow is in my heart. I am without friends or home or kindred on earth. It was not always so. Once I had a mother with her old heart crushed with sorrow, she went down to her grave. I once had a wife, a fair angel-hearted creature, as ever smiled in an earthly home. Okay. Her blue eye grew dim as the floods of sorrow washed away its brightness, and her tender heart I wrung till ever, every fiber was broken. I once had a noble boy, but he was driven from the ruins of his home, and my old heart yearns to know if he yet lives. I once had a babe, a sweet, lovely babe, but these hands destroyed it, and now it lives with him who loveth the little ones. Do not spurn me, my friends, continued the old man. There is light in my evening sky. The spirit of my mother rejoices over the return of her prodigal son. The injured wife smiles upon him who turns back again to virtue and honor. The child angel visits me at the nightfall, and I seem to feel his tiny hands upon my feverish cheek. My brave boy, if he yet lives, would forgive the sorrowing old man for treatment that drove him out into the world and the blow that maimed him for life. God forgive me for the ruin I have brought upon all that were about me. I was a drunkard. From wealth and respectability, I plunged into poverty and shame. I dragged my family down with me. For years, I saw the cheek of my wife grow pale and her step grow weary. I left her alone to struggle for the children while I was drinking and rioting at the tavern. She never complained, though she and the children often went hungry to bed. One New Year's night, I returned late to the hut where Charity had given us shelter. My wife was still up. And shivering over the coals, I demanded food. She told me there was none, and then burst into tears. I fiercely ordered her to get some. She turned her eyes sadly upon me, the tears falling fast over her pale cheek. At this moment, the child in its cradle awoke and uttered a cry of hunger, startling the despairing mother and making new sorrow in her breaking heart. We have no food, James. We have had none for several days. I have nothing for the babe. Oh, my once kind husband, must we starve? That sad, pleading face and those streaming eyes and the feeble wail of the child maddened me. And I, yes, I, struck her a fierce blow in the face, and she fell forward upon the hearth. It seemed as if the furies of hell were raging in my bosom, and the feeling of the wrong I had committed added fuel to the flames. I had never struck my wife before, but now some terrible impulse drove me on, and I stooped down as well as I could in my drunken state and clenched both my hands in her hair. For mercy's sake, James, exclaimed my wife as she looked up into my fiendish countenance. You will not kill us. You will not harm Willie. And she sprang to the cradle and grasped him in her arms. 
I caught her again by the hair and dragged her to the door. And as I lifted the latch, the wind burst in with a cloud of snow. With a fiendish yell, I still dragged her on and hurled her out amid the darkness and storm. Then with a wild laugh, I closed the door and fastened it. Her pleading moans and her sharp cry of her babe mingled with the wail of the blast. But my horrible work was not yet complete. I turned to the bed where my oldest son was lying, snatched him from his slumbers and against his half-awakened struggles, opened the door and thrust him out. In the agony of fear, he uttered that sacred name I was no longer worthy to bear. He called me father and locked his fingers in my side pocket. I could not wrench that grasp away, but with the cruelty of a fiend, I shut the door upon his arm and, seizing my knife, severed it at his wrist. It was morning when I awoke, and the storm had ceased. I looked around to the accustomed place for my wife. As I missed her, a dim, dark scene, as of some horrible nightmare, came over me. I thought it must be a fearful dream, but involuntarily opened the outside door with a shuddering dread. As the door opened, the snow burst in, and something fell across the threshold with a dull, heavy sound. My blood shot like melted lava through my veins, and I covered my eyes to shut out the sight. It was, oh God, how horrible. It was my own loving wife and her babe frozen to death. With true mother's love, she had bowed herself over the child to shield it and wrapped all her clothing around it, leaving her her own person exposed to the storm. She had placed her hair over the face of the child, and the sleet had frozen it to the pale cheek. The frost was white on the lids of its half-opened eyes and upon its tiny fingers. I never knew what became of my brave, brave boy. Here the old man bowed his head and wept, and all in the house wept with him. Then in the low tones of a heartbreaking sorrow, he concluded, I was arrested, and for, a long, and for long months I was a, ra a raving maniac. When I recovered, I was sentenced to the penitentiary for 10 years, but this was nothing to the tortures I've endured in my own bosom. Let me stop there and say something to you right now. What you don't understand is if you do something on liquor like that, if you live your life like that, and you do things like that, they never leave here. God will forgive your sins. Yes, he will, but you'll never forget what you've done. You'll, you'll never forget what you've done. Ever. And I can tell you part of the reason why I preach the way I do is because of things that I did when I was a lost man and the absolute wicked life that I lived and how I hate it. And like the Apostle Paul, I have to have a revenge against it. He said, and now I desire to spend, li listen to what he said, though. He said that this was nothing to the tortures I've endured in my own bosom. And now I desire to spend the little remnant of my life in striving to warn others not to enter a path which has been so dark and fearful to me. When the old man had finished, the temperance pledge was produced, and he asked the people to come forward and sign it. The boy of the father referred to referred to leaped from his seat and pressed forward to sign the pledge. As he took the pen in hand, he hesitated a moment. Sign it, young man. Sign it, said the venerable speaker. Angels would sign it. I would write my name in blood 10,000 times if it would undo the ruin I have wrought and bring back my loved and lost ones. The young man wrote Mortimer Hudson. The old man looked. He wiped his eyes and looked again, his face flushed with fiery red, and then a death-like paleness came over him. It is. No, it cannot be. Yet how strange, he muttered. Pardon me, sir, but that was the name of my brave boy. The young man trembled and held up his left arm from which the hand had been severed. They looked for a moment at each other's eyes, and the old man exclaimed, My own injured boy. The young man cried, My poor dear father. Then they fell upon each other's neck and wept till it seemed as if their souls would mingle into one. Thus we see the misery and wretchedness this fearful giant in temperance brings upon the drunkard and upon all his family. If you love those at home, make up your minds that you will never cause them such sorrow and shame. Keep everything that intoxicates from your lips, and you will keep the giant from your home. Do so because he is an enemy to comfort and happiness. Those of you 
Anyway, so he goes on to explain that. He's going to go on to explain other things we won't, we won't go into, but you understand that story. True story. You ever think that man never thought, I can guarantee you, that man never thought he'd do that. He never thought he'd do anything like that to his children, to his wife. But guess what? That wouldn't have happened if he didn't take one drink. And I can tell you one thing. If you abstain from it and you never touch it, those same things will never happen to you. The, the, the woe of the drunkard will never happen to you. The judgment of the drunkard will never happen to you. You have no idea how something can take you completely out of your mind. It is like a devil possession that comes over the drunkard. It is the opposite of being filled with the Spirit. Children, you ought to purpose it in your heart to never touch it. Never. Like Daniel, who purposed in his heart never to touch it. More men have beaten women, have killed women, have killed their children. More women have done the same. Drinking liquor. You have no need of it at all. None whatsoever. I would abstain from all appearance of evil, as the Bible says, and not come anywhere near it. Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for the truth. Thank you for our Bible. And thank you for men that stood up and preached it faithfully over the years. Thank you that, Lord, your scriptures are easy to understand. If we just stay away from those things, they can't harm us. Dear God, help us never to be so foolish to think that we can take fire into our bosom and not be burned. Lord, please help us to preach the truth to others. Help us to warn them. Help our children, Lord, to understand the dangers of, of alcohol, of beer, of wine, of mixed drinks, and of drugs, and, and all those things, Lord. Help them to understand how absolutely dangerous those things are. And to stay as far away from as they can and be filled with the Spirit of God and walk with you. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be careful when you drive out there. It's a little uh, slick out there. Uh, somebody told me, Dave told me that it's a little slick. So if 